In the words of Francis of Assisi, when he met Brother Dominic on the road to Umbria, hi. <laughs> I returned to Wichita with uh, mixed feelings. The joyful part has been a reunion with friends that have gone back 20 years, beginning with Greg Quisenberry, who was Rich Mullins, you know, road manager. Uh, the delight of seeing you all again. And of course, the heavy heart is for Rich Mullins, who became my dearest brother. And I have a picture of him with his guitar sitting in my office in New Orleans. And uh, there are some people in your life that, you, that will never be replaced. And Rich was one of those men. I would estimate easily 5,000 people have come to read my books who never heard of me because of Rich, uh, because of his music, because of his mention of, because of writing a preface to the Ragamuffin Gospel. So it's with those feelings that I come here tonight, but truly delighted and grateful and feeling very privileged to be with this community. My hometown is Brooklyn, New York. And for the last 23 years, I've been a transplanted Yankee living in the deep south in New Orleans. Still trying to learn how to say hi, why, my, my. And bye. I'm sure you know that Brooklyn, New York is, a, is the largest Jewish community in America. So I grew up surrounded by Jewish culture, Jewish values, Jewish spirituality. And to this day, two of my closest friends are Jewish. Uh, so one of my hobbies over the years has been a study of Yiddish humor. There are some wonderful stories in the Yiddish tradition, like the story of Israel Schwartz. One day, Israel Schwartz said to Yahweh, Yahweh, is it true that for you? A thousand years? Is just a minute? And Yahweh said, yes, that is true. Then Yahweh, is it true that for you, a million dollars is just a penny? And Yahweh said, yes, Israel, that is true. Israel Swartz said, Yahweh, give me a penny. <laughs> and Yahweh said, certainly, it'll only take a minute. <laughs> I'm going to speak for a minute tonight. <laughs> Over the last several years, my ministry has been identified more than anything, with the theme of healing our image of God and ourselves. My books, The Ragamuffin Gospel, Abba's Child, The Signature of Jesus, The Wisdom of Tenderness, uh, The Relentless Tenderness of Jesus and others, have aimed at dispelling illusions and myths about an unreal God and helping people to experience the God of Jesus Christ. This, by the way, I believe is the main business of Christianity. It is not a matter of simply how to think properly about God, but of actually experiencing him. Losing our illusions is difficult because illusions are the stuff that we live by. The spirit of God is the great unmasker of illusions, the great destroyer of icons and idols. God's love for us is so great that he will not permit us to harbor false images, no matter how much they seem to comfort us. God strips away those falsehoods because it is better to live naked in truth than clothed in fantasy. Throughout the course of Christian history, down to the present day, there persists this chronic temptation to reduce God to a human dimension to express him in clear ideas. Human reason seeks to understand everything, penetrate everything, reduce everything to its own clear conceptual thought. It's a noble enterprise, but in so doing, 
we rob God of his otherness and confine to our world of our own mental limits. In the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas warned against this when he wrote, if you comprehend God, he is not God. A comprehended God is no God at all. In the same vein today, the Zen master says, if you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. That is, if you think of comprehending the Buddha, destroy your comprehension of him. The secret of the mystery is, God is always greater. No matter how great we think him to be, God is always greater because God is God. In the most literal sense of the word, he is unique, uncreated, infinite, totally other than we are. He surpasses and transcends all human concepts, considerations, and expectations. He's beyond anything we can intellectualize or imagine. And that is why God will always be a scandal to men and women, because he cannot not be comprehended by the rational, scientific, finite mind. With these brief remarks as an introduction, I invite you tonight to stretch. The key operative word in this presentation is stretch your mind, stretch your heart. If necessary, renounce the security of an unexamined faith. Let go of all merely human concepts of justice, mercy, love, rectitude, fair play. If necessary, let go of everything you've heard all your life about God and find your own understanding of the Holy One rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. What was the message of Jesus concerning God? What did he really preach? What did he really teach? And what did he really mean? Well, biblical scholars today tell us that if we want to be most confident that we are in touch with the original message of Jesus, that we should turn to his parables, quick, decisive stories that make clear the fundamental points of his teaching. For our purposes tonight, we're going to look briefly at two. First, in Matthew 20, the parable of the crazy farmer. As you recall, it's harvest time, work is plentiful, and every morning the farmer is out of the marketplace, which is the hiring hall of his day, like manpower today, to recruit workers for his fields. Now, given the time of year and the amount of work available, one can assume at least the great Lutheran biblical scholar, Joachim Jeremiah says we can assume, that those who were still idling today with small talk at the 11th hour, five in the afternoon, were lazy in a shiftless bunch. <laughs> we can further assume that the 11th hour workers took their time getting out to the field, shuffled around a lot, did very little work. But at pay time, they received a full day's pay. Now, those who heard Jesus tell the story found that his ending had a sharp twist. In this familiar rabbinic parable, meaning other rabbis of Jesus' time had told a similar story, in their version, those who worked the one hour got the whole day's pay because they worked so hard in the one hour. But in the version of Jesus, the emphasis is not on the diligence of the workers, but on the gratuitous generosity of the farmer. It was a mad, crazy, insanely generous act. No farmer or businessman in the year 2006 could indulge in just reckless generosity, remain in business very long. Suppose you were in a company with 100 workers, and 80 of them work a 40-hour week. The other 20 come in at 4 o'clock Friday afternoon. They work one hour till 5. And then at pay time, you give them all the same wage of $2,000 for their week's work. Your partners, your colleagues, even your family would say, your cheese just slid off your cracker. <laughs> You're not playing with a full deck, man. I mean, that is not only crazy, that is unjust. That's the response of the workers in Matthew 20. They go to the farm and say, see here, this is grossly unfair. We're out there all day long in the scorching heat. Now you give these latecomers the same wage as us. That is unjust. And the farmer replies, my friends, I do you know injustice. Didn't we agree to the wage of a dollar a day? 
Take your pay and go. Am I not free to do as I like with what's my own? Or are you envious? Because I'm generous. I'm telling you, the last will be first, and the first last. As I've traveled around the United States the last 30 years, speaking in a wide ecumenical setting of churches, from Roman Catholic to Southern Baptist, to Methodist, Episcopalian, Lutheran, uh, Moravian, Quaker, uh, countless evangelical churches, and numerous colleges and universities. I'm appalled, appalled at the number of American Christians who are scandalized by the generosity of God. We're in, they're out, by God, they're out. In the last play that he wrote before his death, the great French playwright John Arnoul describes the last judgment as he sees it. The good guys, the just, are standing before the gate of heaven, they're keyed up, bursting with impatience, share with their reserved seats. They can't wait to go marching in when suddenly a rumor starts. Look, look, he's gonna forgive them too. What? Then, if through what I've been through, they get forgiven? I can't believe it. <laughs> Exasperated, they work themselves into a fury and they start cursing God. And that was the last judgment, you see. They judge themselves, excommunicated themselves. God appeared in Jesus in the form of an infinite, boundless, extravagant mercy, and they refused to acknowledge him. I want nothing to do with the heaven, so I'm going to read Tom, Dick, and Harry. I spurn this so-called Messiah is letting them all off. And because they could not transcend the limitations of their own finite expectations, who the Messiah should be, they could not recognize him in Jesus. And the same theme is replayed in what the scholars call the pearl of the parables. You recall in Luke 15, the prodigal son, so often a life of waste and wandering, boozing and womanizing, and returns home, not to the expected condemnation, but to a merciful acquittal, as his father goes running, stumbling, falling down the road, and when he sees his wasted son, he does not demand, where have you been? What have you been up to? But he falls on his neck, kisses him, new rub over his shoulders, new sandals on his feet, new ring on his finger, and says, kill the fatted calf, we're going to party for 14 days. Hardly an appropriate way to treat a delinquent kid. I mean, the kid is spoiled rotten in the beginning, you spoil him again, he's never going to change. That's crazy behavior. Have you ever identified with the older brother in this story? Muttering to himself, that rat Fink didn't come home when he's good and ready. <laughs> All the time I stay home, fattening his calf, that my father's ever gonna roast for that dork? I mean, I believe being kind too, but this is off the wall, my father's wacko. At any rate, the older brother, a serious, hardworking young man, didn't like it one bit. He saw his father's love, and it made him indignant. He saw his father's indiscriminate compassion, and it made him angry. If you ever have the opportunity to spend Easter in France, whether you're in a large metropolitan area like Paris, Bordeaux, Dijon, or a little village like I lived in for six months, saint rémy in the forest of Bourgogne, on Easter morning, you'll see this one phrase written on the sides of buildings, it's on the backs of buses, it's in block print, it's in script, it's graffiti. But the same phrase is sung, recited, chanted in all the Christian churches. In fact, on Easter morning, when Christians pass in the street, they exchange this phrase as a greeting. L'amour de Dieu est folie. L'amour de Dieu est folie. L'amour de Dieu est folie. The love of God is folly, folly, foolish, crazy. Jesus is a folly that calls forth joy. In Matthew 20, the farmers of Paul, the workers who celebrate his generosity. In Luke 15, the father of the prodigal is brokenhearted, the other brother who came into the celebration. Jesus is saying that God 
is extravagantly loving and calls for a joyous response from us. These two parables, among others, are both a revelation of real God from Jesus Christ and a call to conversion from us. Jesus' image of God assaults our invulnerable standards of justice, mercy, rectitude, fair play. The very foundations of our religion are being shaken. The depraved, good-for-nothing prodigal loved as much as his older, hard-working brother. Celebration instead of punishment. What kind of lunatic justice is this that abolishes all our sacred standards, reverses all order of rank, makes the last first, the first last, and in the end, all get the same reward? I am not a universalist. I want to make that abundantly clear. Universalism is a heresy that makes the death and resurrection of Christ irrelevant. But the key operative word here tonight is stretch your mind and stretch your heart to accommodate the God bodied forth in Jesus of Nazareth. The parables of Jesus portray a God who is consistently over generous with his forgiveness and his grace. In Matthew 18, Jesus is his God is like a magnanimous, merciful king wiping out a debt the size of our national deficit. In Luke 7, Jesus, once again, his God is a lender, generously canceling a debt, in this case, the lifetime sins of a hooker. In John 10, Jesus, his God, does a very foolish thing. He leaves the 99 unprotected in the wilderness to go out in search of one lost and lonely sheep. In Luke 18, Jesus, as his God, hears the prayers of slum lords, drug dealers, hookers, or in first century Palestine, tax collectors, and prostitutes. Again and again, God is seen afresh by Jesus as a God of surpassing goodness and of boundless, infinite mercy. My friends, I believe that Christianity happens when men and women experience the reckless, raging confidence that comes from knowing, from experiencing the God of Jesus Christ. With this God, there is no need to be wary, no need to be scrupulous, and no need to be afraid. In his first letter, John writes, in love there can be no fear, for fear is driven out by perfect love. Because to fear is to expect punishment. And anyone here tonight who's afraid of God, you don't know him. Or as John puts it precisely, you are imperfect in your understanding of the love who is God. Why does it take us so long to lay hold of this essential truth of our faith? One reason I'm convinced is that the love of God incarnate in Jesus is radically different from our natural and human way of loving. When I love as a man, I'm drawn, I'm attracted, I'm attracted to certain persons and things. For example, I love the Jersey Shore and Clearwater Beach at sunset. I love Handel's Messiah, Hot Fudd Sundays, my family in New Orleans. I'm drawn, I'm attracted to certain persons and things that I find congenial and appealing. So when I love as a man, I love someone for what I find in him or her. But, unlike ourselves, the God and Father of Jesus loves men and women, not for what he finds in them, but for what he finds in himself. It is not because men and women are good that he loves them, nor only good men and women that he loves. It's because he's so unspeakably, unutterably, unimaginably good that the God and Father of Jesus loves all men and women, even sinners. He does not detect what is congenial, attractive, and appealing, and then respond to it with his favor. He doesn't respond at all, for the God of Jesus is a source. He acts, he does not react, he initiates love, he's love without motive, and because the love is creative, it originates good rather than rewarding it. That's why St. Augustine could write those lyrical lines, quia amastime, 
Fechisti me and love them. In loving me, you made me lovable. Huh? Why is bread and manning lovable in the eyes of God? Because almost 50 years ago, on February 8th of 1956, in a shattering, life changing experience, I committed my life to Jesus. Does God love me? Because since I was ordained in 1963, I've committed the last two 40 years of my life to roam in the country lately of the world, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of grace. Does God love him because I tithe to the poor? Does he love him because I spend two hours every day in prayer? Does God love him because back in New Orleans, I work on Skid Row with alcoholics, addicts, those suffering with AIDS? Does God love me because I was rigorously faithful in my marriage? If I believe that stuff, I'm a Pharisee. Then I feel I'm entitled to be comfortably close to Christ because of my good works. The gospel of grace says, Brennan, you're lovable for one reason only, because God loves you, period. Hard as this is for us to grasp, because we neither give nor receive love among ourselves in this fashion, Yet we believe because of the life, death, and resurrection of the carpenter Messiah that his God, his Father, is more loving, forgiving, and cherishing than Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob ever would have dreamt. All these words of mine simply to restate what it says in every page of the Christian scriptures. The God and Father of Jesus is gracious. He loves us in the way that defies human comprehension and escapes human imitation. And that is why I can stand here tonight and with theological certainty in the power of the word proclaim God loves you unconditionally as you are and not as you should be because nobody in this building is as they should be. That God loves you, not the person next to you. Not that God loves Billy Graham and Mother Teresa. Not that God loves in some vague way the whole human race. But the truth that God loves you in such a way that he'd rather die than be without you. Isn't it difficult to believe you're worth it to anyone? Least of all the all-holy God. Do you honestly believe that at this moment that God, knowing your whole life story, loves you as you are and not as you should be because you're never going to be as you should be? Do you believe this? <coughs> you know, I've not asked a Christian in 20 years, do you believe God loves you? He's never replied, oh yeah, yeah. I've done that quite a while. <laughs> then you watch the way they live. Lives of fear, anxiety, shame, guilt, low self-esteem, self-hatred, Oh, they believe that God loves them in some vague, distant, abstract way, but they'd be hard-pressed to say that right now the essence of their Christian life is a love affair, and not just a simple love affair, but what G.K. Chesterton called a furious love affair going on between Christ and themselves at this very moment. Do you truly believe that with all the wrong turns you made in your past, the mistakes, the detours, the moments of sin, selfishness, dishonesty, and degraded love, that God has used them all to bring you where you are tonight, and the word says you're standing on holy ground. This moment, do you honestly believe that God loves you beyond worthiness and unworthiness, beyond fidelity and infidelity, that he loves you in the morning sun and the evening rain, without caution, regret, Boundary limit breaking point. No matter what's gone down, he can't stop loving you. If you don't trust that you're living a life of illusion, superstition, cowardice, you are projecting onto Jesus your own negative feelings toward yourself, assuming he feels about you the way you feel about you, and thus you're worshiping a God of human manufacturing, a God who does not exist. There is one God of the Christian vision, 
the God revealed by and in Jesus Christ, who this moment comes directly to your seat and says, I have a word for you. He's looking you straight in the eyes. I know your whole life story. I know, every moment, I know every moment of brokenness and sinfulness that has darkened your past. Nothing is hidden from my eyes. And my word is this. I dare you to trust that I love you as you are and not as you should be because you're never going to be as you should be. Biblically, to trust in the love of God means to accept with my head and my heart that God loves me in a creative, intimate, unique, reliable, and tender way. Creative, out of his love I came forth. Through his love I am sustained in existence. In fact, my next heartbeat is love and gift from the Father's hand. His love is intimate. Do you have a skeleton in your closet in your past life? Something you did so shameful so evil, so utterly self-centered, when you think about it, your palms start to perspire, and you say, please God, don't let anybody ever find out about that. The intimate love of God reaches into that dark place. You know in the scriptures, reconciliation is not primarily making peace with somebody else. It's first of all, making peace in that part of yourself where you can never find peace before, such as the intimate love of God. His love is unique, meaning God loves me not as you think I am, or as I think I'm supposed to be, but as I really am. And the real Brennan Manning is a bundle of paradoxes and contradictions. I believe in God with all my heart, but on a given day when I see 300,000 people wait away in a tsunami in Southeast Asia, Asia. And I see three six-month-old babies in New Orleans floating down Lake, Lake Pontchartrain, ripped out of their parents' arms, their mother's arms, by 145 mile an hour winds. When you see a nine-year-old girl raped and murdered by a sex maniac, or a four-year-old boy slaughtered by a drunken driver, I wonder if God exists. I trust him and I get discouraged. I love and I hate. I feel bad about feeling good. I feel guilty if I don't feel guilty. <laughs> I'm wide open and I'm locked in. I'm trusting and suspicious. I'm honest and I still play games. Aristotle said I'm a rational animal. I say I'm an angel with an incredible capacity for beer. That's the real Brennan. And God's unique love reached out and embraced me as I really am, not as I assume I'm supposed to be. His love is reliable, meaning it's never let me down. I'm sure of this. If we have the opportunity this weekend to share your life story and mine, we'll find a striking similarity in at least one respect. Both of our lives have been a celebration of God's faithfulness in good times and in bad. Ironically, it was April Fool's Day of 1975. And at 6.30 in the morning, I woke up in a doorway on Commercial Boulevard in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I woke up in an alcoholic fog, sniffing the violent love of my sweater, staring down at my bare feet. Didn't know why I'd stolen my shoes during the night to buy a bottle of Thunderbird. I was in the late stages of chronic alcoholism. I was drinking a quart of vodka a day, two six packs of beer, a half gallon of Chablis wine. I was sleeping on the beach till the cops chased me, in doorways, under the bridges, clutching my little precious bottle of taka vodka. And it wasn't just that I drank too much. I broke every one of the Ten Commandments six times Tuesday. I mean adultery, fornication, theft to support my habit the idolatry of the bottle rather than the lordship of Jesus, coveting my neighbor's goods, coveting my neighbor's spouse. 
who is a life where the fabric of my moral life completely unraveled. And that morning when I woke up in the doorway, I saw a woman coming down the street, maybe 25 years old, blonde hair, attractive lady. She had a four-year-old son in her hand. The boy broke loose from his mother's grip, ran over the doorway, and stared down at me. His mother came up quickly behind him, cupped her hand over his eyes, and said, don't look at that filth. All that is is pure filth. She broke a rib of mine. And just about 30 years ago, that filth was Brennan Manning. And the God I've come to know by grace, the Jesus I've met on the grounds of my own self, loved me as much that morning in a state of disgrace as he does tonight in a state of grace, for his love is never, never, never based on our performance, never conditioned by our moods of elation and depression. It knows no shadow of alteration or change, the love of God in Christ Jesus is reliable. My friends, this isn't something I read in a book. This isn't something I heard in a sermon. This is the Jesus of my own journey, the son of compassion whose love is so far beyond our human comprehension, beyond our human imitation. All we can do, at least once in our lives, is go, wow. The love of God is tender. Tenderness is what happens when you know you're deeply and sincerely liked by somebody. Maybe a woman has never, never said to one of you guys, you know, you know Brad Pitt. But you've got a heart of gentleness, of kindness, of respect for me that makes you worth more than 100 million, 100 movie actors. Or anybody said to one of you women, I know you know Paris Hilton. <laughs> but your heart of compassion, your other-centered concern, your devotion to God, your love for me, is the most beautiful experience of a woman I've ever met in my life. Tenderness is what happens when you know you're deeply and sincerely liked by somebody. If you communicate to me this weekend that you really like me, not just love me as a brother in Christ, but really like me, whether I never wrote a book or never gave a sermon, but you like me for who I am, then the look of amiable regard in your eyes banishes my fears and my defense mechanism like sarcasm, ridicule, name dropping, giving you the appearance I got it all together. All that falls away, but I sense you like me. I'll become more open, sincere, vulnerable, and affectionate with you than I'd ever dream of being, but I thought you didn't like me. What happens is I grow tender. My friend Ed Farrell up in Detroit goes on his two-week summer vacation to Ireland. Reason? His favorite uncle is celebrating his 80th birthday. Well, on the morning of the great day, Ed and his uncle get up before dawn. They get dressed in the darkness and silence. They go for a walk around the shores of Lake Killarney. Just as the sun is about to rise, his uncle turns and stares straight at the rising sun. Ed didn't know what to do. So he stands beside his uncle, shoulder to shoulder, 20 full minutes, not a word exchanged. And then his uncle, his 80-year-old uncle, goes skipping down the road, and he's beaming, radiant, smile near to ear. Ed Farrell catches up to him and says, Uncle Seamus, you really look happy. He said, I am, lad. You want to tell me why? Yes, you see, you see, the tears washed down the old man's face and his beard. You see, the father is very fond of me. Oh, me father is so very fond of me. 
If I ask you right now, do you really believe that God likes you, not loves you, because theologically, God has to love you. <laughs> God loves by necessity of nature. Without the eternal interior generation of love, God ceases to be God. <coughs> if I ask, do you really believe he likes you, and with gut-level honesty you could reply, oh yes, the Father is very fond of me. There would come a relaxedness, a serenity, a compassionate attitude toward yourself and your brokenness. And you wouldn't have to bother by buying my new book over here, The Wisdom of Tenderness, because you're already living in it. <laughs> the awareness of being loved. By the way, I believe the real difference in the American church is not conservatives, liberals, fundamentalists, charismatics, evangelicals, mainline uh, Protestants. The real difference is between the aware and the unaware. Show me the man who will go strolling through a mall tomorrow afternoon. Stop at some, a men's clothing store. Ostensibly, he's looking in the window at the merchandise, but he really isn't. He's got his eyes closed. And at that moment, he's becoming aware in faith that at that very moment, he's being seen by Jesus with a gaze of infinite tenderness. The awareness of being loved enables us to love ourselves without excuses and without questioning. If God knows my whole life story, every broken moment in my past, every act of sin that I've committed, and loves me and accepts me as I am, Am I going to be so arrogant as to demand more of myself than he does? Self-acceptance is not pop psychology. It's not the power of positive thinking. It's a profound act of faith in the acceptance of Jesus Christ of me as I am and not as I should be. The awareness of being loved moves us beyond the oppressive demands of the ego self. The ego self that is constantly saying, I know my life is such a grave disappointment to God. I've got to get my act together. I've got to change. Okay, that guy Manning is going to be over there at Hilltop. I'm going. I've got to hear a word that's going to change my life. I've got to get rid of all these lustful thoughts, all this judgmental spirit of other people. I've got to get rid of my greed and my preoccupation with money and sex and power. I've got to have a profound conversion experience. I know I should. I should. I really should. That's the key operative word of the person who hates himself. I should. I should. I really should. Got this dear friend in New Orleans. Remarkable woman, Mary Michael O'Shaughnessy a double doctorate in scripture and theology, walking into a home, got a huge banner on her wall. You know what the words on it say? Today, I will not shit on myself. <laughs> I will not shit on myself. And when her friends say, Mary Michael, you should take a vacation, you should get back in the, back in the classroom, she says, don't shit on me. The awareness, and I mean a living, conscious awareness of being loved, enables us to risk becoming our authentic self rather than a carbon copy of somebody else. I mean, the peer pressure, not only among teenagers, college students, but the peer pressure in the Christian community is absolutely appalling. Oh, my God. My friend Gene Barnes, uh, close friend in New Orleans, takes a three-day vacation, drives over to uh, western Georgia. And Gene is very much like me. He's an airhead. Has no sense of anything practical. He's driving down, thinking all these lofty thoughts, and he runs out of gas. <laughs> now, he steps out of the car. He's on a red clay road, doesn't know what to do, so he starts walking this way. He sees an old black evangelical preacher coming toward him wearing a clerical collar. 
Gene walks up to them and says, Reverend, do you have a word for me? And the Reverend said, yes, I do. Be who you is, because if you ain't who you is, you is who you ain't. Boy, what wisdom in that. Be who you is, because if you ain't who you is, you is who you ain't. Dare to become that unique and singular expression of truth, goodness, and beauty that God had in mind when he created you, that the world's never going to see if you cave into peer pressure, shout with the crowd, and become like everybody else. Do you see why the scriptures attach so much importance to knowing God? Because healing our image of God heals our image of ourselves. Yes, healing our image of God heals our image of ourselves. Yahweh says to his prophet Hosea, my people are fools. They know me not. It's love I desire, not sacrifice. And knowledge of God, not holocausts. My friends, I hope it's neither arrogant nor presumptuous to say this, but in my own mind, in my 42 years of preaching the gospel, I believe God has never given me a more important word than he has tonight. This theme of repudiating these false, unreal images of God, of totally rejecting these caricatures of God that keep us living in the house of fear and not in the house of love. 2,000 years ago, God drew us on the curtain of eternity, stepped into human history in the man Jesus. And now the awesome love of our invisible God has become both visible and audible. And this is the purpose of the central mystery of our faith, the incarnation. As John writes in the prologue of his gospel, we have seen his glory, the glory of an only son, filled with enduring love. The Apostle Paul, who may have understood the mind of Christ better than anybody's ever lived, writes to the Ephesians, May Christ dwell in your heart through faith, and may love be the root and foundation of your life. Then you will be able, with all the saints, to grasp the breadth, the length, the height, the depth of Christ's love, which is beyond all knowledge. Do you hear what Paul is saying? The love of Christ is beyond all knowledge. Stretch, man, stretch. Stretch, woman, stretch. Let go of your impoverished, circumscribed, finite, legalistic, human perceptions of God and open to surrender to the God enfleshed in Jesus until Paul says you're filled with the utter fullness of God. My friends, that's the message of Jesus concerning God. So I might want to quibble about a point here or there, but I'm sure this among the theologians and biblical scholars of our churches, there is no serious debate that this, this is the essence of the good news. In healing our image of God, Jesus frees us of fear of the Father and dislike of ourselves. Has Jesus set you free of fear of the Father and dislike of yourself? If not, you have still not accepted the total sufficiency of his redeeming work. Jesus brings good news. The old religious image of a vindictive, angry, punitive God gives way in Jesus to a God who cherishes all people, even sinners. Jesus presents a God who doesn't demand, but who gives, who doesn't oppress, but raises up, who does not wound, but heals, who does not condemn, but forgives. Woe then to those. Woe then to those who wound, oppress, condemn, and punish in his name. It can only be said they do not know the God of Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Not about him. Not repeating what you heard somebody else say. 
Is this your personal experience of him? Here's one way you'll know if you know God. We all make our images of God, but even truer, our images of God make us. Yes, our images of God make us, and we start to behave like the God we image. Four years ago, I drove from New Orleans out to Cajun country, Lafayette, Louisiana, to meet with a very gifted woman who, who took me through a healing of memories. She said, Brandon, go back into your past life as far as you can. What's your first conscious memory? I thought for a few minutes and I said my fourth birthday. Why do you remember that? It was the first time my mother let me have a birthday party. Why then? Well, this is kind of weird, but my hometown newspaper, the Brooklyn Eagle, ran a contest for the best looking three-year-old boy in the city. When I was three, I was quite chubby. I had these great big, same blue eyes, this very curly gold colored hair, and very affectionate. Anyhow, to make a long story short, my mother submitted the picture and I won the contest. I admit it was a lean year for three-year-olds in Brooklyn. <laughs> but anyhow, my mother gets $10. And you know, back in the 1930s, that was big bucks. Oops. You don't say big bucks anymore. The new yuppie phrase is major coin. Yeah, he generates major coin, man. <laughs> my mother's not going to have the birthday party, but I can't invite any of my little children and my little friends. There'd be no other children. I say this without a trace of recrimination, bitterness, or mean-spiritedness, but I never knew a moment of love for my mother in my entire life. I have not one memory of her being held, hugged, embraced, kissed. Never once told I was a good boy. My mother was a registered nurse. When she came home from work, I was in the apartment all alone. I would run to her, throw my arms around her, she would push me off and say, leave me alone, you're such a nuisance, you're such a pest. Go over there, sit down in the corner, basically shut up and die. One day my mother came home early from private duty nursing. She caught me in her bedroom with all the paste jewelry on the floor. My mother screamed, God is going to get you for that, he's going to get you good. My mother was behaving like the God she imaged. I have to add this. My mother was born in Montreal, Canada, and at the age of three, both of her parents died in a flu epidemic, which killed over 100,000 in Montreal. My mother wound up in an orphanage, which I later visited. It is a wicked, wicked, nasty place. My mother never knew any love as a child. She was in the orphanage for 10 years till she was adopted. And constantly want to never give any as a parent. Well, the birthday party began, and instead of children, my mother invited three married couples, friends of her and my dad. And they came in, they haven't seen me since my infant baptism. They're picking me up, they're hugging me, they're kissing me, telling me what a wonderful little boy I am. I'm like a little sponge. I mean, I'm sucking up every bit of attention and affection I can get. My mother said, stop that, it's disgusting. Well, I stopped, because I knew I'd get hit if I didn't. I was hit so badly by my mother when I was eight years old that I have no memory of between ages eight and 16. Well, we sat down at the dinner table. My father sat at one head. I was allowed to sit at the other because it was my birthday. Hey, I had one of these little two cent birthday caps on, you know, the pointed thing with the rubber band under the chin. Well, a man came in, a latecomer, his wife couldn't come. He greeted nobody, walks over to my chair, picks me up, throws me in the air, pulls me down, and he kisses me on the forehead, the eye, the cheek, the neck. And then he stared at me for about 20 full seconds. And he said, your eyes are brilliant. You're very intelligent. You're very bright. 
and you've got a heart of deep feeling for hurting people, you're going to have a wonderful life. And now I really start to act out. I am grabbing my arms around him. I'm rubbing my nose against his. I'm chewing his hair. I'm biting on his ear. And my mother said, why do you insist on shaming me? Why do you shame me in front of my friends? Your birthday party's over, go to bed. Well, this ghastly Paul fell over the table. I marched to my bedroom. I didn't, never hesitated. My mother said, shut that door behind you. Now I'm standing in the bedroom. It's pitch black. There are no lamps in the bedroom, only an overhead light. I'm too short to reach the light on the wall. And in the darkness, I started to cry. I guess it was a combination of being afraid, of being humiliated, of a profound experience of rejection and abandonment. My father ne never said a word the entire time. I had a strong sense there was nobody there for me. And the tears just flowed and flowed and flowed. Now, my mother had always told me to wear my pajamas to bed. But for some reason, even being temporarily naked in the darkness while I found my pajamas in the drawer was too frightening. So I left my clothes on, found the pajamas, pulled them on over my clothes, crawled into bed, I pulled up the cover, and the thought hit me, my mother's going to come in right now and demand I give back the birthday hat. I cannot exaggerate how much that birthday hat meant to me. At age four, all I knew was that people were nice to me, people gave me gifts, people not only spoke to me, but they even listened when I spoke to them, it was all because I wore that hat. If I could wear the birthday hat for the rest of my life, Oh, what a picnic on a green lawn life was going to be. They took off the hat. I shoved it under the pillow. I said, I'll just lie to my mother. Tell her I lost it. Don't know where it is. Well, going back to the healing of memories in Lafayette, Louisiana, there I am, four years old, lying with my heavenly father. I said, hi. <laughs> he said, hi. Where's your birthday hat? I sat under the pillow. He said, sit up and put it on. I sat up, I put it on. He reached out and he held me. He said, now hear me well. No one will ever take your birthday hat from you. And no one will ever tear you from my hand. Well, I felt a great wave of peace. But in a few minutes, the guilt returned. And I said to my Heavenly Father, Abba's, Abba, I was going to lie to my own mother until I lost my birthday hat. You know what my Heavenly Father said to me at age four? The identical words that his son Jesus spoke to me 37 years later when I was 41 years old and after a year and a half of living in the gutter in Fort Lauderdale, I mean, a life of utter shame and moral degradation. A life of theft, a life of greed, a life of utter self-absorption. Two friends got me up to Hazelden, Minnesota, kind of the granddaddy of all the alcohol rehab centers in the country. I was supposed to go for 28 days. I wound up being there four months because my condition in alcoholism was so far advanced. The first month, I never even attempted to pray. I was so covered with guilt and self-condemnation and indescribable shame, a self-hatred that was consuming. It was a Monday of the fifth week. I went outside the main facility. I sat down on a park bench, and I made this feeble attempt at prayer. I said, Jesus, I've wandered so far from you. You said, if you love me, you'll keep my word. I haven't loved you. I've not kept your word. You let me find the pearl of great price, and I swapped it for a cheap plastic bottle of vodka, and I am so sorry. Then, like a bell sounding deep in my soul, I heard a voice from within. 
And Jesus Christ spoke to me the very same identical words at age 41 that his Heavenly Father spoke to me when I was four years old. He said, Don't bother me with that stuff. Now come over and play. Is this wishful thinking? Is the good news too good to be true? Or is this the God incarnate in Christ Jesus who reveals who the true God is and not all the aberrations, distortions, and caricatures that litter the American Christian landscape today? Tonight, will you let Jesus come to you? And let him be who he really is. The one who came to save sinners. A savior of unbearable forgiveness. Of infinite patience with our failings. With a love that keeps no score of our wrongdoings. Will you let Jesus enter your life. And love you as you are. And not as you should be. I ask you to gently close your eyes and join me in prayer. As best you can, tune to everybody else around you. As that lovely Quaker phrase goes, center down, sink into the center of your grace being. In faith, become aware of Jesus dwelling within you. Recall his word in John 15, 4. Make your home in me as I make mine in you. Now don't think anything. Don't intend anything. Don't promise to perform anything. Just grow still and let yourself be loved as you are in your brokenness and not as you should be. It's one thing to understand intellectually he loves you. Quite another thing to realize it, to experience it, to be in conscious communion with it. Now hear this word of the Apostle Paul as though you're hearing it for the very first time in your life. Nothing, absolutely nothing can come between us and the love of Christ. Even if we're troubled, frightened, lonely, unfaithful, depressed, tilting toward despair, unemployed, divorced. These are the trials through which we triumph by the power of him who loved us. I am certain of this. Neither death nor life, no angel, no prince. Nothing in the past and nothing down the road can ever come between us and the love of God made visible in Christ Jesus our Lord. I consider this homework assignment such a vital, essential, integral part of this weekend that if you get too distracted or preoccupied with other things and fail to do it, you may deprive yourself of the richest blessing of the weekend. I ask you to spend 20 minutes before we return here tomorrow morning. What time are we starting tomorrow? Huh? 10. But before you return here tomorrow, 20 minutes with these four passages. And in doing, I want you to do this silently and alone. God gives himself to you completely only in silence and in solitude. And the four passages are Isaiah 43, 1 through 5. Ephesians 2, 6 through 10.
1 John 4, 16 through 19. And the last is Psalm 103. Now in Psalm 103, it says God loves those who fear him. Remember the biblical meaning of fear of the Lord. Silent wonder, radical amazement, and affectionate awe at the infinite goodness of God. Once again, the true biblical meaning of fear of the Lord is silent wonder, radical amazement, and affectionate awe at the infinite goodness of God. Before I close with a blessing, I want to say because of the fatigue of traveling from New Orleans today, I'm going to exit immediately. I don't mean to be rude, but I need to get back and get to sleep. So if I can meet the two people who are going to be driving me back there out at that door right back here, I'd be very grateful of that. And let me close with this blessing written by my spiritual director of New Orleans, Larry Hine. May all your expectations be frustrated. May all your plans be thwarted. May all your desires be withered into nothingness. That you may experience the powerlessness and poverty of a child. And sing and dance in the love of God, who is Father, Son, and spirit. Amen. In the words of Francis of Assisi, when he parted company with Brother Dominic on the road to Umbria, bye. <laughs>